So this uh, presentation, Life and Death on Silverleaf Lupin, uh, contains photographs that uh, were taken by my friend and colleague Mei Chen, and she also wrote the text. Mei has created two other presentations that are on the Natives Garden Tour YouTube channel. One is called Life and Death on Milkweed, and the other is on the Bridgeview Pollinator Garden in Oakland, and you can search on Mei Chen to find these videos. So this presentation uh, features the small creatures that visit the native silverleaf lupin and the extraordinary things they do to survive. Um, it's an honor for me to be able to give this presentation for May, who could not um, be with us today. So as I was reviewing this talk, I realized that aphids are one of the bases of the food chain in the garden. And as you'll see, so many of the insects that come to the lupin are there because of the aphids. As gardeners, we're used to thinking that it's a crisis if we see aphids in our garden, but that's kind of like saying we don't want to see plankton in the ocean. Without plankton and without aphids, food chains would collapse. So part of the way through my review of this presentation, I had to stop and go outside and examine my own lupins, and I was disappointed to see there's no aphids. I've been looking for them uh, longingly, and I still am. I want to see the variety of insects that come in a garden to feed on the aphids. I hope by the end of this talk, you'll feel the same way. Um, so as May wrote this talk, when I say I here, it's really May speaking. I've spent a good part of 2022 exploring and documenting the insect diversity of Skyline Gardens, a restoration project in the Berkeley Hills. You can Google Skyline Gardens to find their website and you can volunteer with them if you're interested. The land belongs to our local water district, the East Bay Municipal Utility District, and the largely wild garden is tended by a dedicated group of volunteers who call themselves the Skyliners. They practice a form of ecological restoration that calls for the removal or suppression of exotic species in areas where high concentrations of native species persist. This work has been going on since 2016 and Skyline Gardens has become a popular wildflower destination in the East Bay. 288 species of native plants have been seen in this ecologically rich area. Today, I will be talking about one species, the silverleaf lupin, Lupinus albifrons, which can be considered the garden's signature plant. The lupin blooms gloriously on steep hillsides in spring, supporting myriad insects. The silverleaf lupin thrives on the east-facing slopes of Skyline Gardens. This large native perennial shrub seems to enjoy full sun and good drainage. Let's talk for a moment about the flower structure of the lupin. This is important later on when you see the bees that pollinate this plant and how perfectly the flowers and the bees are made for each other. The flowers are found at the tips of the branches. Individual flowers have a pair of upright petals that are fused. These are called the banners. When the flowers of silverleaf lupin first open, they have white banners. These are the upper erect petals. After the flowers are pollinated, the banners turn reddish purple, as seen in the older flowers in the lowest part of the slide. So I've been examining the flowers on my lupins now and seeing you know, how the bottom ones do turn purple. The color change is the plant's response after it has been pollinated and is no longer receptive. Bumblebees, who are the lupins' principal pollinators, use the colors to guide them to the fresh flowers with the biggest rewards. This arrangement benefits both the plant and the pollinator, maximizing pollination efficiency. Lupins belong in the pea family. This diagram shows a dissected view of a pea flower. Two fused upper petals are sometimes referred to as the standard or the banner. A pair of lower petals are called wings. They form a space that encloses a structure called the keel. The reproductive structures, both male and female parts, are hidden within the keel. The wings come together loosely on the top to form a flat horizontal surface on which the bee may land. The lupin flowers are mostly pollinated by heavy-bodied bees, such as the bumblebees. Here's a happy yellow-faced bumblebee carrying a large load of lupin pollen in the pollen baskets on its hind legs. The orange pollen appears very bright as it has been mixed with nectar to form a wet lump. These borrowed images show a side view of the lupin flower. The lower picture shows a tripped flower 
that has a wing petal removed so we can see the keel inside. Note that the reproductive organs, the stigma and stamens have popped up from the keel after a heavy bee has landed on the flower. So here, a yellow-faced bumblebee has landed on the flat surface formed by the wing petals of the lupin flower. The bee pushes its head against the banner to access the nectar at the back of the flower while pushing down on the wing petals with her feet, parting them. This pops the keel, allowing the reproductive structures to hit the bee's belly. The stamens for forcefully dab the bee with pollen while the stigma picks up whatever pollen is already on her belly. The flower is pollinated and the bee gets its reward of nectar and pollen. It's a win-win. This shows why lupin flowers require heavy-bodied bees for pollination. This lupin flower has been visited by a large bumblebee. Let's see, yep, this one. This lupin flower has been visited by a large bumblebee whose vigorous action has pushed aside the wing petals, exposing the sharp-tipped keel and the reproductive structures held within. So here you can see pollination in action. This is a yellow-faced bumblebee foraging on silver leaf lupin flowers. As the bee lands on the horizontal shelf created by the paired wing petals, its weight depresses the petals. The keel underneath and the enclosed reproductive structures are exposed momentarily, dabbing the bee's underside with pollen. The process is enhanced by the bee's efforts to reach the nectar at the back of the flower with its tongues. Yay, pollination and nectar for the bee, and pollination for the flowers. At Skylines Gardens, another species of bumblebee, the black-tailed bumblebee, also pollinates the lupin. Like the bumblebees, these digger, digger bees are heavy-bodied, and they are also capable of pollinating the lupin. This ability is not shared by the smaller bees, such as the honeybees, and anything smaller. Here, a female California mountain digger bee is excavating a nest adjacent to the lupin patch moving clods of soil with her legs. She is easily recognizable by the white hairs on her hind legs. As the common name implies, these bees nest in the ground. They are one of the earliest bees to appear in early spring in perfect synchrony with the lupin's bloom period. Yikes, this lupin stem is studded with aphids. The aphids are so densely packed that they completely cover the stem, all with their heads down, sucking on plant sap. The aphids match the color of the lupin stem almost perfectly. The lupin aphid spends its entire life cycle on lupins. It lives mainly on the leaves, stems, and flower spikes. The aphids sequester the toxic alkaloids of their host plant for their own defense. Further up the stem, many more aphids can be seen. These aphids are rather large and they are dusted with a powdery white wax. This wax is thought to limit their contact with the sticky sugary honeydew that aphids excrete and possibly provide them protection against fungi, parasitoids, predators, dehydration, or frost. Among the flower buds, a mature aphid is giving birth to a baby. Many species of aphids are capable of cloning themselves and giving birth to live young without having to mate. This mode of reproduction can result in explosive population growth. This is why aphids can colonize a plant overnight. Lupin aphids cycle between asexual and sexual phases. In spring, the aphids reproduce asexually, producing all female progeny from cloning. In the fall, sexual forms with winged males developed to diversify the gene pool. A commotion lower down on a lupin stem alerts me to the presence of this minute parasitoid wasp. The aphids are going wild, wiggling their butts in the air. Aphids emit an alarm pheromone and wag their behinds in synchronous waves in response to a perceived danger. By this collective defense behavior, colony members warn each other of the approach of a predator or a parasitoid wasp looking to inject eggs into the aphids. Common predators include surfeit flies, lady beetles, soldier beetles, lace wings, aphid midges, and spiders. Thus warned, aphids sometimes stop feeding and drop off the plant. 
This aphidious wasp is an aphid's worst nightmare. The mummy maker parasitoid wasp is necessarily small, about the width of a nickel. After all, it grew up inside of an aphid. And here's the story. The female wasp hunts down aphids and injects a single egg into each victim. The wasp larva develops inside the host aphid, eating it from the inside out. Pupation occurs in the aphid and the adult wasp emerges from the host by cutting a big round hole in the back of the aphid. Here, the female wasp descends into the deep recess of the blossom with a singular purpose, to lay her eggs. She curls her abdomen between her legs to inject an egg into the plump aphid. Do you see this straw-colored aphid? It's an aphid mummy. Note its altered color and shape. It may still be alive, but if so, its days are numbered. The parasitoid wasp inside has yet to emerge from this aphid. These parasitoid wasps are commonly used as biological agents for the control of aphids in gardens and in agriculture. In another area, a female surfid, also known as a hoverfly, is laying eggs on the tender flower buds of a silverleaf lupin. We are looking at her head front on. As she lifts off and shows her back, I can identify her as a white bowed smooth wing hoverfly. Although these hoverflies do not pollinate the lupin flowers, they are effective pollinators for other plants in the garden. Do you see the white surfeit egg at the base of the lupin flower bud? It looks like a tiny grain of rice. When I took the picture of the aphid, I didn't even see this surfeit egg. Surrounded by a glut of food on a spike of lupin flower buds, a small surfid or hoverfly larva has chosen a very small prey, a baby lupin, lupin aphid. Surfid females like to lay their eggs among aphid colonies to ensure that the young that hatches out will have plenty of aphids to eat. A large surfid fly larva seems to be taking a midday siesta on the tip of a lupin leaf. This surfid fly larva is feeding on a tiny lupin aphid. Not surprisingly, I often find California lady beetles on the silver leaf lupins. They are predators of aphids, but it is rather unusual to see them in such a, such a dense aggregation. What is going on here? I don't see any aphids here. Maybe they've all been eaten. Like the adults, the larvae of lady beetles are voracious predators of aphids. Here, a lady beetle larva is feeding in the recesses of the flower buds while pooping at the same time. The aphids are not the only insect herbivores feeding on the silver leaf lupin. I often find this unusual leaf arrangement on the lupin. One of the leaflets has been turned over atop two or three leaves that have been drawn together with silk. What's more, the leaflets are somewhat damaged and discolored near the tips. This appears to be the retreat of a leaf tire caterpillar, most likely a small moth. Now that I know what to look for, I can easily find more of these caterpillar retreats on various young lupins. The pale discoloration of the leaflets, probably from feeding damage, is a dead giveaway. Each retreat is built with four or five leaflets. Always, a leaflet is turned over across another leaf to form a roof. The caterpillar can safely feed in the space within, sheltered from predators and parasites. The caterpillar is a born pro with an innate ability to construct these retreats. I gently pull apart the leaves that were tied with silk and find a little caterpillar resting on the bottom leaf. Exposed, it moves quickly and repels to the ground on a strand of silk. Calscape lists seven small moths that are hosted by the silver leaf lupin. I wonder which species this is. The architecture of the retreats is amazingly consistent, implying that the insect is probably specific to the lupin. The adult moths are probably a good food source for the local lizards and birds. Do you see the jumping spider on the silvery beige flower buds of lupin? It is amazingly well camouflaged. Jumping spiders are free ranging hunters that do not construct webs. They stalk their prey then pounce on them at close range. 
stopping to watch a bumblebee forage among the lupin, my eyes catch a flash of red on top of a blossom. It is the abdomen of a female red-backed jumping spider. This is one of the largest of our jumping spiders. The males have an all red abdomen. The spider turns around to face me, an endearing behavior typical of these bold and intelligent hunters. Jumping spiders are known for their superb eyesight and leaping abilities. If it hadn't moved, I would not have spotted this slender spider plastered against a stem of silver leaf lupin. Its two front pairs of legs are held neatly in front of it, hardly breaking the online of the stem. This is the first time I encounter a slender crab or running crab spider. These spiders do not build webs. Instead, they actively hunt their prey, but they do use silk for drag lines and egg sacs. They are somewhat hairy spiders with an elongate striped body, and they are often found on grasses, leaves, stems, and stalks where they wait to ambush prey. Their elongate body is well suited to flattening and camouflaging against such vegetation. Female crab spiders are good mothers, guarding their egg cases dutifully until the spiderlings emerge. Irregular lumps can be seen on some of the lupin leaves that are also folded along the midrib. These tumor-like growths are galls induced by the leaf fold gall midge. Females lay their eggs on unopened leaflets in growing buds. Newly hatched larvae crawl between the closed halves of the leaflets and begin feeding, stimulating formation of the swollen galls. The midge larvae complete development inside the gall and remain there through pupation. The midge produces several generations per year. Oftentimes, all the leaflets on the same leaf are galled. I'm blown away by how much life the silver leaf lupin supports. When fully developed, the fleshy, the fleshy leaf fold galls can appear somewhat like tiny pea pods on the lupin. Though common and numerous, the galls don't seem to calm, cause much harm to the plant. Why should we care about these tiny insects? Although tiny, the gall midges actually play an outsized role in the ecosystem. Like aphids, these tiny herbivores occupy the base of the food web, feeding carnivores further up the network. A tiny predator is patrolling the galled leaves of silverleaf lupin. I see it is a soft-winged flower beetle. These soft-bodied beetles are about the size of a pea or smaller. Most adults and larvae are predaceous, but many are common on flowers. Here's another, even smaller predator, a predatory mite. It is feeding on what looks like another mite. The predatory mites feed on plant feeding mites, as well as thrips and other small insects. They are faster moving and slightly larger than their prey. Predatory mites are widely used to control pest mites and they are commercially available. Wow, someone has chewed through the wing petals and the keel of this silver, line, silver leaf lupin flower. It's a clean, precision job. Is the culprit after the pollen? This flower was cut through before it even opened. The insect has cut through all the layers of the corolla, exposing the immature stamens. Did it enter the flower to get to the nectar? I look around for clues. There are several ants crawling on the flowers of this plant. Yes, ants certainly have the jaws to cut through the petals. Even the well-hidden treasures of the lupin flower are not safe from the ants. Here's a likely scenario. Not able to access the reproductive parts of the flower, like the bumblebees do, the ants simply resort to thievery. Oh, a pair of weevils is mating behind the banner petals of a lupin flower. How sweet. Could these beetles be responsible for chewing through the lupin flower? Backlit by the sun, the individual peas are visible through the pods of lupin. Somebody has been robbing seeds from the silverleaf lupin by chewing through the green pod walls. This slide shows an aging blossom with petals fading into an inky, inky blue. The petals have shriveled revealing the developing seed pods within. This silverleaf lupin has already started to disperse its seeds. Pea pods often use mechanical dispersal. When the seeds are ready, 
the pod dries up. The interior surface of the pod wall dries faster than the exterior surface. This makes the pod twist inward, suddenly splitting open violently, rolling into a little spiral. When this roll happens, the seeds are flung from the pod in all directions. It is fascinating following the silver leaf lupin through the seasons. The plant supports a whole ecosystem unto itself. Herbivores, carnivores, predators, parasitoids abound. While some of the insects may appear to harm the plant, the lupin always recovers in the end. The insect diversity ensures that. The mix of characters keep each other's numbers down so that nobody comes to dominate and wreak havoc on the ecosystem. It's like a jigsaw puzzle where every piece contributes to the whole picture. The skyliners never lift a finger to control the insects, yet the lupin thrives year after year. It behooves us to keep this holistic picture in mind and to work to encourage and preserve the insect diversity in our gardens. Thank you, you astonishing person, Mei Chen, for taking those photos and writing those charming captions and putting that presentation together. If you wanna see any of May's other work, you can go to the TOR's YouTube channel. And she's got a great presentation on called uh, Life and Death on uh, Milkweed. It's about aphids on milkweed. And it's another great story. I'd like to particularly thank our major sponsors, the Alameda County Flood Control and Water Conservation District, the Clean Water Program, Alameda County, the Contra Costa Clean Water Program and the Contra Costa Water District um, that have funded the tour for many years and really make the tour possible. It wouldn't be possible to run the tour without their help. These programs and I are hoping that you will help birds, bees, and butterflies by eliminating pesticide use in your gardens. You'll keep yourself, your children, and your pets safer by gardening without the use of toxic chemicals. And I'd like to thank these additional sponsors for their support for the Bringing Back the Natives Garden Tour. There's too many for me to list, but I'm certainly grateful to all of them for providing the base funding that allows us to put the tour on.